get started here. Uh, good morning, I came up this morning and said, well, you're getting ready to work for today. I told him I felt like a little bit back my young days, preaching now and then. I was, there was a little church not far from us, throughout the Texas, that was mainly just old women. Well, it was not mainly, it was just really old women. And so you go there to preach, you have the whole thing. I was song leader, preacher, class teacher, did the Lord's Supper. I thought I could just do that today. He asked me earlier in the week because of the funeral, and, and he knew I was doing these things today. You know, did, did I want to lay some it off? And I didn't know exactly when the funeral was going to be there. I thought, oh, more of it's prepped, I could do it. But I have to admit, I wasn't thinking about it from your perspective. So if you've had it, Plenty of me. I'll just cover my eyes here and walk out. No judgment. We are picking up here in the second of these first three weeks where we're doing some introductory and primarily background study related to when we get into Revelation in, in the actual text. And so We've talked about a little bit of when, where, why, and I want to give you just some quick reminders. One, that again, I think it, you know, whatever date you choose of this, I think that it is important for me that those, I think there's commonality among people who may think that 60s or 90s are the date when it was written, that I think in our niche of the world, the emphasis still is, hey, this was written to real churches, real people facing real events. You know, that, you know it, it's a problem in Scripture, not just in Revelation, but in general, if we kind of bypass the original intent direct, you know, and act like it was written directly to us, well, you can come up with all sorts of ideas. And you see that in the book of Revelation. People sometimes pick it up as if it was never written to real people in the first century, and it was just written directly to me. Well, you can imagine that. That's going to lead to very different conclusions about what it may be about. As we said, you know, there's this sort of debate that goes on 60s, 90s, 90s, probably the dominant view of this century, but there have been many, many, you know, uh, scholars who have taken that early day view. Philip Schaff, 19th century scholar, has Eight volume set in the library here. History of the Christian Church is one of the most, I guess, well known. But Alfred Edersheim, who authored that Life of Jesus was high, and many others. But again, it's not a how many experts you have on this side and that side. I will say, we're going to proceed with this 60s leaning, not with the idea that, oh, if you don't think this, you're stupid. You know, and I, I'll call this a 60s light. That because we don't want to spend all the trimester just back and forth and oh, what's the view of this? What's the view of this? We're going to proceed more or less with leaning. When we talk about specific meaning, now we want to always be talking about the specific meaning. And as we go through this book, I, and I think Lawrence and I, as we taught it last time, we came to realize you know there are different views of it, and Lawrence is going to talk about that in a later class. You know, one of the views is that it's pretty much all about the past. Another view is that it's sort of unfolding of events that are happening then and continue to happen. Another is that it's all is about the future. Another is that it's sort of an idealization of situations that commonly arise before this. Well, we're a bit eclectic of that. <laughs> you know, that we're this is really a hybrid view. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll come back to that. So, look, if along the way after we get the text, there's some meaning that you think, hey, this would be useful if we view it not just in a 60s way, but in the 90s. Yeah, feel free to interject that. But like I said, we're not going to just have a back and forth about the dating. Uh, as we said, this is real people, real churches trying to help them face trials that they're going through or about to go through and doing so by helping them understand Jesus Christ better. And as I've mentioned already, trying to, as we go along this, as we do another section of scripture, balancing, trying to get a handle on the meaning that was intended originally, as best we can, and then drawing application and use for us 
rather than just bypassing directly and acting like it's written directly to us, but recognizing there are limits to our ability to look into the exact meaning of the past. So doing our best in that way. But this is an important sidebar I didn't mention last Sunday, but we're, again, attaching this sort of the 60s, the destruction of Jerusalem to this, it's not suggesting, and we don't, we're not of a mind that, well, that means every judgment mentioned in the New Testament is about the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, I think there's mention and of referencing in the end of time, as we would refer to it, that a final judgment in that way. I think even in Revelation, I think both of us view it as there are things that extend beyond just the the immediate time context. And I think that's one of, again, sometimes the, I think the proponents of the early day view <clears throat> hard, have hurt themselves by trying to kind of shoehorn everything into how that, you know, if, if it didn't happen in the 70s then, or 60s AD, then, you know, it's not in, it's not covered in this book. Well, I, I, I don't think that we take that view here. And we'll talk a little bit about that sort of thing today. Quickly, kind of going back over a couple of things that Lawrence talked about. I, I, you know, I made up the schedules. So I gave him the impossible jobs, and I, I saved myself more doable things. So, like I said, I had to cover all this Old Testament stuff about that might relate to Revelation, then do that in one class. And so, I think Lawrence did a good job Wednesday. I did that. I don't think any of us could have really. Encapsulated that, but I wanted to remind us a little bit these images and words and themes. I'm going to play a little matching game with you, so I'll show you some images here, and you match these up with some of the things that we're talking about. Now I'm going to work backwards. We're going to start with things that are closest to the time of time, and then work back. So these images, what and words, where are those from? Dead. Right. So we have the coming of the Son of Man in clouds. We have these beasts, these four beasts and the dragon. We have this reference to time, times, a half time, or three and a half, as the way we would say it. And so, again, I think not so much we thought, well, we're going to be going through the book, and so we can reference and look back at these things. So we don't have to try to explain all that, but I think getting a feel for the fact that these kinds of phrases and images are used, that way you're not just hopping into a book going, well, what and where in the world did this come from? And recognizing that some of you are very well acquainted with this imagery, but I was reminded in, there was a Facebook post a uh, young woman had about Verna this week and saying, you know, she started coming here with her husband and said she really didn't like it. She said the people were nice, but she said, you know, I really, much of what was said kind of went over my head. I was only giving about 50% of what was said. He said, you know, Vernon started to talk to me and he asked me to come up with this class about kind of Bible basics. And sometimes I think those of us as teachers, we do forget, well, not everybody we're talking to has been here for 20, 30, 50, 70 years. And so, you know, a little bit of this is just, again, getting familiar with some of these words, phrases, and images. So, what about this? I, I borrowed this. Lawrence mentioned the Bible Project, so I just, I don't know, playing the loose of the for copyright law. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, what, what would this, where would this be drawn from? In fact, I give you a little hint with the number 16. <laughs> Some of you who do know the Bible very well. Ezekiel. This Ezekiel in the you know, he goes on, it's not just the adult or rebellious wife, and there's two these two prostitutes, and some of the most graphic language of the Bible describes Israel and how she was this child that was in the dirt and had been raised up and taken care of by God, but then turned into a beautiful bride, but has become this rebellious and ugly and adulterous wife. And so we see that, I think, in Revelation. 
This, we did mention again, I, I pulled, plucked this from a project. He, Lawrence mentioned, if you have a chance, Ezekiel, the Bible project summary is very useful, very good. This is from Zechariah, another <coughs> book that he, there are many references in one way or another in Revelation. Could you stand aside a little bit? I sure can. <laughs> there you go. Is that a little better? <laughs> so, and it has this image that we see at the end of Revelation of the new Jerusalem and the river of life flowing out of this new Jerusalem. So again, and I like the way Lawrence put it the other day. He didn't some of you may remember what they attached to how, how close they were listening, but he didn't. He said, hey, maybe we shouldn't think of these things as being drawn from Revelation, <coughs> excuse me, drawn from the Old Testament and used in Revelation. Maybe instead we should think of them as shown. Right, shown, right. That these things are overlapping and these visions are in common. You know, it's not that, well, let me think, what can I pull out of the Old Testament? <laughs> that these are kind of continuing visions of uh, the same sorts of things, or at least closely related things. So, now it gets a little easier here. I think we should work back to things all of us are familiar with. So, what about this? Eden, right. So, now Lawrence wanted to really make sure we talked about the chair of the West guy. So, this is definitely about the best image. So, these cherubim that have appear in the garden and then appear other places in scripture, the tree of life, the river of life, the stepping on the head of Satan, the serpent, the dragon. You know, again, these are images that really filter into the images in Revelation. And then this is in some ways maybe the most overarching set of images that we see in Revelation. Well, the temple images, you know, the holy of holies, and the temple, and then these representations of it, the, excuse me, the temple representing sort of earlier the tabernacle and what we saw in Mount Sinai, and all of that really referencing <coughs> you know, these images that we see, not just in Revelation, but in some of these Old Testament passages of the visions of heaven, Revelation 4 and 5 and others. So, again, just recognize that when we get to Revelation, John seems to be looking into some of the very things that people like Ezekiel and Zechariah were given a vision of. And in other kind of symbolic ways, other things in the Old Testament were precursors of these sorts of images or at least copies of the heavenly things as Hebrew says. All right, another question I didn't get to Sunday, last Sunday. So we have all these grand images and these symbols. Why is Revelation written that way? Why not just, you know, the rest of the books of the New Testament contain very little of that sort of thing? So why, you know, here's the question of the Holy Spirit. Why did you give us something that seems bound to create controversy? We'll talk more about sort of different views, as I noted. But different views of Revelation began, we can see those from the second century on. Why not just write it more in a direct way that you might write 1 Corinthians? Keep its meaning hidden from unsafe people. Yeah, and this is a, it's an interesting thing. There, there's been some pushback. That, that's often been the answer and over, at least maybe for many decades, but in recent decades, this pushback against that. But I think that still holds some weight in that in one way, and, and the pushback comes to the parent and the tension here is because what's the name of the book? <laughs> Revelation, and revealing. And so it's sort of the 
Bush Pact has been. This is a book about the revealing of Jesus Christ, not the veiling of Jesus Christ. But I think it is true that both of those seem to be going on. There is an explanation. There is a revealing. But it does seem to be written in a way to hide certain things or make at least them much more difficult for hostile eyes to just go, hey, you're being seditious. You know, that you, you're, you're, you named the Roman emperor here. Well, it doesn't just come out and say, this is Nero, or this is Domitian, or this is Vespasian. And so I think that there is truth to that. And yet at the same time, it does that. It's, it is also a book about revealing. It's kind of, we didn't talk about this in our paradox class, but I think it fits this sort of paradox of scripture that we see. What's another reason? Well, they're, they're living in epic times. Big things are happening in the world. By telling this in an even larger epic scheme, it puts the events of the real world, the present world, into a much larger uh, picture and plan of God. Yeah, we've got big messages, big story here. You know, Harry isn't just <coughs> our resident, really expert historian on films and filmmaking, but he's down lit filmmaking. Well, what would Harry and I could go out here? We can make a film about, you know, Lawrence and it's often mentioned things like Lord of the Rings. We can make our own Lord of the Rings movie. <laughs> but, you know, it would be a small set. You know, this might be our sound stage. <laughs> and people go, well, you know, when I read the books, that seemed, this doesn't seem to capture the grandeur and the bigness of Because what, what are the themes of this book? Reveals all the things that have happened prior to. Yeah, it's it's sort of a culmination of God's big plan of things that started in Genesis that transpired through the Old Testament and now things that are about to happen and things that are earth shaking. And so I think the bigness of the story, the epicness of it, is part of it. And also, my little film reference here. What was their, what were their films in ancient times? Poems. It, right. Sort of the epic poem was all. You know, many. This was a style that was often used to represent these big stories. These sort of epic prose, epic poetic presentations and so you know think about it we we do have now you know 200 million dollar films that have all sorts of effects and trying to trying to bring to life big story you know that's one of the reasons things like lord of the rings are hard to do that before you've got things like cgi you know because this includes <clears throat> visions and things it'd be hard how do you represent this if you have just you know, it's all little sound stages. You know, it's hard to do this on a Casablanca kind of film approach. This was this was a way of making these things really events that are big, giving visualizations in ways that really stuck with people, that people could carry with them in their minds. And I think that's a way to think about revolution as in many ways, it is like a big drama. It's almost, in some ways, if you don't view it as an opera that has many sections that are very song-like. You know, it's presented as a grand story. Any other idea, Lawrence, you seem uh, Yeah, just no, like C.S. Lewis said, the imagination is the organ of meaning. And I think that there's a, a meaning that we sense when we see something that captivates our imagination through, through the images that are being described. It would be one thing, for instance, this, and it has, like you said, power. It's, it's one thing if he says um, the Roman government is a very powerful and persecuting entity. Okay, well, there's a good fact, right? But it's another thing entirely when you see a beast rising up out of the sea with, you know, ten horns and seven heads and right. like oh 
Wow. Right. You, you mean he, he really is. Not yeah. only is that well said, but now we have our C.S. Lewis quote. <laughs> I'll add one other thing and this is something that as you teach lower grades you really see not revelation I've never tried that in lower grade. <laughs> but, but for example we have these fabulous stories that were told they may have been told at the time they may have gotten the Israelites you know moved along but they also were told for us they were saved for us I mean, this may have been written for someone then, but it was saved for us. And so the curiosity of, of us trying to figure out all of this brings a level of attention to the story, just like for the two- or three-year-old, Noah's Ark brings the attention to the story. And so the whole Bible is full of these things that not only do we gravitate toward once, but multiple times in our lives we'll come back to a story or a subject because we don't quite get it or because we're at a different place in our lives. So that's one of the things that makes the Bible just the grandest book. Even if it was just a book on its own, it would be the grandest book. Yes, again, I've never heard of Revelation, but all of several of these Old Testament books that are structured the same way seem to be doing, they're telling big stories and trying to do this in the ways that I think you all have helped us think about. So, you know, you have this story of restoring life, this huge story of de how God is dealing with redemption and evil, but it also gives us insight into things that in some ways are indescribable. The Father, the Son, in settings and what happens, where do they exist? What's what life? Where do they exist? So that brings up. I was going to ask you all this question, and I didn't intend to put this on. If, if you'd like a schedule, we have some here. I didn't intend for these to slip into the schedule, but I meant to take those out. So you, you but I'll ask you real quickly what are some timeless lessons? And we're going to talk about this at the end of the trimester a bit more. But just a preview of some of these without getting into them in great detail. What are, what are some lessons that can be drawn from these big stories? <coughs> Somewhat independent of you know, what the specifics of what 666 means. I think one of the big things that has stuck with me is, I think it's three different times in the book, They'll talk about the saints calling out from under the altar and talks about all of these martyred and the, you know, the prophets and all these who had blood was shed because of their allegiance to God. And they cry out, how long, how long? And repeatedly, it's just a little bit longer. And it, this book shows us that God hears the cries of his saints and he does answer and he answers decisively. Other ideas? Although this is a, an epic book, and we use that word a lot uh, in yeah. my revelation, it's big. <laughs> we sometimes forget it starts with seven letters to ordinary churches dealing with their everyday problems. And so there's a connection between the huge and the small everyday things that we deal with. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Uh, no, in fact, well, I'm going to go ahead and put up the list here, and most of which are on the list. But the thing Carrie is mentioning, I think Lawrence really brought this up last time, like five, in no, four years ago. But the idea, heaven is closer than we think. The connection between us and heaven, we might think more as a <coughs> difference in dimensions than a difference in, well, God's out there somewhere in the great universe and we're here. That, and so the small, our everyday life, it is connected to it. I think this book is emphasizing it's connected. And the things that are happening now on a bigger scale of society, well, these things are disconnected from this heavenly and spiritual dimension. But one of the things that stood to me, I'm gonna have to move on here. We're not going to get to the main lesson today, but <laughs> is I have not really, it's really not sunk in with me, but in reading up on Revelation, somebody, you know, kind of take away 
lessons from Revelation, understanding who Jesus really is. Think about it. This is the revelation, the revealing, not just so he can do this and that, but it's showing the very nature of Jesus. He's a lamb. He's a conqueror. He's one extending mercy, redeeming saints, bringing justice, but also judgment. He is a multifaceted being. You know, we don't think of ourselves as flat pieces of paper. You know, Amy here, I'm, she's quiet. She's not going to say probably much today. But, you know, Amy, just like the rest of us, I couldn't just say, well, Amy, you know, we sometimes do this. You know, give me a one-word definition of Amy. Well, you know, we could do that sort of thing. But we need many words. <laughs> and certainly if that's true of us, isn't that true of Jesus? And the Father? And I think Revelation is a real chance to see in to deeper and deeper who is Jesus Christ. And so, let me hop along here. Uh, Hebrews. So we see Old Testament themes crop up or symbols in the New Testament. It's not just unique to Revelation, although you don't see it a whole lot. One place is in Hebrews, you know, when he says things like, you haven't come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness and storm, gloom and storm. Lawrence and Seth and somebody else were teaching Hebrews, and one of the things about Hebrews is we often sort of lump it in with, say, books like Galatians, letters like that, and think of it in terms of, well, here is encouraging these Christians not to go back to Judaism. I, I don't think that's really the, the right way. I think this was talking about this class. These are Christians living in Palestine who, you know, what happens when Paul goes back and Acts 21 goes back to Jerusalem and the men are coming from James. What do they say to Paul? Well, we've been hearing that you've been teaching that you know, Jews don't need to adhere to the law of Moses. Well, have you been teaching that? Yes, he had. He's been writing books like Galatians. What would have prompted them to even ask such a question? Well, they're still doing it. Again, we often collapse everything down into a very short window as if, well, on Pentecost, everybody, all these Jewish Christians now say, okay, all this old stuff is gone. You know, this is a progressive kind of thing. They come to an and even letters like Galatians weren't immediately circulated among all Christians. And so this was a progressive re revelation. Of, and what he's doing in Hebrews, I think, when he says things like, you know, you all need to grow up. By, the time, by now, you need to be moving on on just baptism. You, you should be coming to understand you already, you don't need this high priest anymore. You have the high priest. You don't need these sacrifices. You have, you don't need the temple. You have the true temple. And all of this seems to be a preparation for trials that they're going to face. And we'll talk about that more in another class. But he comes to here and he uses this imagery. What's his imagery drawn from? The mountain here is Mount Sinai <coughs> that they couldn't really approach. He said, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the Jezebel, to the spirits of the righteous faith perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, those of you who know Revelation, what, what chapters of Revelation does this seem to really overlap with? Well, this whole, the scene as a whole, well, very similar to the scene in Revelation 4 and 5, you know, thousands upon thousands and 10,000 upon 10,000 angels singing. Singing to who? Well, 
the Lamb who has covered and sprinkled every tribe, nation, and tongue. And then visions and statements, phrases like the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. Well, we see the new Jerusalem discussed here, you know, this, this city descending from heaven. But interesting here, what does he say about these things? If we ask, what's the timing that it gets at here? When are these things happening? 20, 2150? You know, Lawrence and I got together and we had our Ouija board and we figured, hey, you know, this, this is all happening in 2150. No, they're living. They say, you have come. This is a, a, we referred to this last week. You know, it, we ought to pass over this. So Peter, I quoted from 1 Peter, we had, that he says, you are receiving the salvation of your souls. Well, does that mean there's not a, sal a, a culmination of the salvation? Well, no, but the Bible, the New Testament writers often refer to, again, what we are getting now and what we will get in the future what is and what will be and sort of the progressive nature of the salvation that we have and this is one of the things too i'll, I'll use this as a quick opportunity to, to refer to we need to be have a little nuance in this sometimes I, we don't agree with kind of what often referred to as pre-millennial views of a thousand years the reign of christ the future and the earthly reign of jerusalem but sometimes people who do believe in that get charged with, well, hey, you're saying Christ isn't king. And maybe you could draw that as an implication, but I think all of those people would say, no, no, Christ is king. Do we believe Christ is king, those of us here? But yet, what does 1 Corinthians 15 say? Is he Lord over heaven and earth now? But 1 Corinthians 15 also notes that, well, He's going to be in this position until he puts all things under his feet. And the last enemy to be put under his feet is death. And then he'll give this position up and himself, you know, things that are hard to understand. You know, he'll become a subject to the Father. But again, my point here is saying that he's king now. And what's said in 1 Corinthians 15, these aren't at odds with each other. Again, this is saying, yes, he is king, and in many important respects, he has already taken dominion over the earth. But that is still going on, too. And I think that's an important thing in studying books like Revelation. There's, there is a progressive nature to God's actions in the world. Now, before the bell rings here, <laughs> I better get to Luke 21, man. I think Luke 21, Matthew 24, real previews of Revelation, talking about big event. And Luke says, we often look at Matthew 24 and sort of, you know, treat Luke 21 as well. You know, it sort of talks about the similar things. I'm going to reverse that. Let's think about Luke 21 because I, he says, they will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison and you will be brought before kings and governor on all account of my name. Who is he talking to? When is this going to happen? Well, he's talking to these Jews that were listening to Jesus here. And he's saying, You're gonna, they're going to hand you over to synagogues. That, that doesn't sound like something that's happening in 2150. Synagogue still exists, but they don't really have a judicial authority. He's talking about things that are going to happen in these people's lifetimes. He goes on. I, I didn't want to talk about this, but I wanted to make sure you do. I wasn't just cherry picking verses just for my purpose here. But he goes on to say then, when you see, in verse 20, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is a time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. Matthew goes into more detail in referencing the Old Testament writers. Luke just sort of 
again, right into a, a, not just Jewish audience, doesn't get into no specifics. He talks about how dreadful that will be and the distress. And then he goes on to say, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Well, what time is he talking about? <clears throat> if you read Luke 21, there's just no reason whatsoever to think this time is any different than the time he's talking about. You're going to be handed over to synagogues. <laughs> yeah, sometimes in Matthew 24, Scott was mentioning this last week, sometimes in Matthew 24, we, we sort of get to some place that you have to go, well, now he's talking about a different time. And this is pretty clear. There's no... There's a continuity. There's no disconnect between what he was talking about before and now. And he says, and it gets very important when you see these sorts of symbolic terms. And because now he says, there will be signs in the sun and moons and stars and earth. Nations will be in anguish, tossing and roaring the sea. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Now, again, if you just hone in on that phrase, if you turn to Luke 21, what do you immediately begin to think? Well, this has got to be a final judgment. This is the end of all time. This is the Son of Man coming in final judgment. But God's judgments in Old Testament, and I think here, are often referred to as God coming in judgment. The heavens opening up for the purpose of judgment. Again, the timing down here in Luke 21, the context is the very same timing and context of what is it put symbolically up here. You're going to be handed over to the synagogues. And so when we get to Matthew 20, well, let me back up. At, you see this in, in Revelation 11, 1 through 12, 1 through 2. I was given a read, like a measure rod, it was told. Go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its works of worshipers, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. Well, <clears throat> there are three more references to 1260 and three and a half here. And so, again, this Gentiles trampling. Holy City. Uh, yeah, if you go to Matthew 23 and 24, Jesus says, oh, this is going to come about because of all the righteous blood that has been shed in this place. And he says, I'll tell you the truth, this is coming on this generation. Yeah, Matthew 24 and 23, Luke 21 are about the same things. And, but he explains more here. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, well, let the reader understand. You should flee. And there's going to be these great symbolic signs. You know, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. And then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. But I've cited where these references come from, Daniel 9, 11, 12, Isaiah 13, 34, Daniel 7. Again, this three and a half, you don't see it up here in Matthew 24 or Luke 21, but this three and a half, 42 months, 1260, that's all the same length of time. You know, 1260 days is more or less three and a half years, it's more or less 42 months. Those are spoken of specifically in these passages back here. And then they're referenced again in, in Revelation 11 several times. So there does seem to be some kind of connection between these things. Again, so the I, let me back up. I'm going to have to finish this up next week, and then I won't finish while I need to talk about next week. But for many of us, almost all of us, it, the, would anyone here have enough Jewish ancestry to refer to themselves as, I'm Jewish? Joy and I did a DNA test because of, you know, our daughter and her illnesses, and we found out we both have a little bit of Jewish ancestry, but we wouldn't claim it, oh, I'm Jewish. We're, you know, we're, as Bible, old Bibles refer 
Turn to the Gentiles. How big is the destruction of Jerusalem to Gentiles <laughs> living 2,000 years after the event? That's a question. Honored. We'll pick it up there next week. Thank you.